Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. After deliberating for seven hours yesterday and finding her guilty of intoxication manslaughter and intoxication assault, there's another job for the jury. It must now consider how she should be punished. Prior to their deliberations, the jury heard emotional testimony from the sister of the man killed in the crash and from a survivor. Paul Vinema now with some of that testimony. The damage caused by this fatal crash went way beyond the twisted wreckage of the vehicles involved. The wreck's emotional toll clearly visible as Valerie Velasquez Palau, whose brother Mario was killed in the crash, testified. Everything changed. My parents will never be the same. We were always a close family. He was, he was everything to us. He did everything for my mom and my dad. Her brother and four friends were leaving a parking lot and were crossing a sidewalk, attempting to enter the Loop 1604 access road when his car was hit broadside by an SUV driven by 24-year-old Rosalinda Olalde. She was drunk and had veered from the access road onto the sidewalk. Four passengers in Velasquez Palau's car were critically injured, including Gwendy Murillo. You think about that day every day? It changed my life because I... I just feel like nothing's the same, losing somebody who was that close, it's really like losing a brother. The testimony wasn't entirely emotional. The defense called an adult probation expert to discuss the conditions of probation. At the outset of the punishment phase of this trial, he told the jury that Olalde had no criminal record and she's eligible for probation. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. The first good news is that Texas now has the ability to test for COVID-19. State testing is conducted by public health labs throughout the state that are a part of what is called the Laboratory Response Network. There are 10 public health labs within the Laboratory Response Network in Texas. Testing for the coronavirus now available in some parts of Texas with more cities with the ability to conduct those tests by the end of the month. That's the word from, for, from Governor Greg Abbott, who provided an update on the state's response from Austin. Labs in Austin, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Lubbock, and El Paso are already up and running. Abbott says labs in Tyler, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and Harlingen will be operational by the end of the month. Metro Health officials say that they have the test kits, but they need two to three weeks to validate them. And when all of the labs are up and running, Governor Abbott says Texas will be able to process more than 125 COVID-19 tests a day. Methodist Healthcare is an example of what local hospitals are doing to protect their patients, medical staff, and others from the spread of COVID-19. Jesse De Goyada reports anyone coming to their facilities will notice what's changed even before they walk in the door. Some entrances here are now closed to control access. Then, once inside... What we're doing is screening for coronavirus to keep everybody safe. Methodist Healthcare is now asking visitors a few questions. Do you have a cough? Do you have a fever? Uh, do you have a significant travel history? All of those coming in while we were there said no. If they'd said yes... We're going to ask them to wear a mask when they're inside our facilities. But if they answer yes, and they're going to the emergency room, rather than potentially expose everyone in the waiting area. We're gonna ask those people to put on a mask immediately. Everyone I spoke to told me these days, screenings could be and should be the new normal. Stay the rest of the world, stay San Antonio, Texas, and so we can continue living a normal life. So I think it's a good thing to check everyone who comes in here. To the hospital, miss a hospital. Especially a transplant hospital where the most acute cases are in recovery or awaiting surgery. A mother who came to share her lunch with her son says it's a safe thing to do. Oh, it's a, it's real good, really. I mean, it's a precaution. Precautions in effect for the foreseeable future at all Methodist healthcare facilities. We need to keep the virus out of the hospital as much as we can. Baptist Health System is doing much the same thing, similar precautions, like here at Downtown Baptist. 
And the goal, of course, is much the same, to protect medical staff, patients, and others. So how do you know if you should go to the hospital? Well, the Chief Medical Officer for Methodist Healthcare offered some advice during this morning's briefing, and we have that posted on our website, ksat.com. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jesse. Another big story today, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick using the anniversary of the Battle of the Alamo to criticize current plans to restore and redesign the Alamo site. Tomorrow will be the 184th anniversary of the Alamo's fall. But Dan Patrick says the Landmarks Master Plan is badly off track, placing blame on the General Land Office led by Commissioner George P. Bush, which oversees the project. The lieutenant governor criticizes the designs he has seen for the plaza. He's opposed to moving the cenotaph. But District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino says the city's Historic and Design Review Commission has already approved the move. Now, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, being reviewed by the Texas Historical Commission, and uh, those are the final steps in uh, what we hope to have uh, uh, begin here in just a matter of weeks. So we're, we're ready to go. We're ready to start the construction. Other elements of the Alamo Master Plan include restoring the church and long barracks and creating a visitor center. San Antonio firefighters say they have a pretty good idea what caused a fire that destroyed a commercial building just north of downtown this morning. Fire crews getting the call around to the 400 block of San Pedro around 10. And when they reached the scene, the building was filled with flames and those flames did a lot of damage. We're told the building is no longer structurally sound. This location, no stranger to firefighters. They tell us they've put out several fires here and in all of those cases, the fires were intentionally set. A woman on the southeast side of the city without a place to call home after being run out of her house in an early morning fire here. The fast moving flames had spread to the homes next door and those neighbors ended up rescuing her. Sarah Costa tells us considering how fast this home was destroyed, it was a good thing the neighbors called. There goes my house. Yeah. Take pictures of the house for the scene. There goes my house, man. Christine Cervantes watched as flames consumed her home that she purchased 21 years ago. The San Antonio Fire Department says the home is destroyed. The fire broke out at 3 Thursday morning in her southeast side home in the 400 block of Shank Avenue. When crews arrived, her home was already being devoured by flames and had spread to the home next door. Firefighters were able to put out the fire in the attic of her next door neighbor's home and saved it. But that wasn't the case for Cervantes. I've lost everything. Now the sun is up, Cervantes and her family or friends are cleaning up to see what they can save. And you can also see how severe that damage is. My clothes, my car, everything is gone. This was where my grandfather's table was. Cervantes says the biggest blow was losing the heirlooms her grandfather left behind for her. Grandpa's table's gone. Oh, don't worry I about know, that stuff. Cervantes' mother comforting her. She is thankful for her neighbors, who she says helped her and her dog to safety. I was stuck in the backyard, and, and my neighbor just grabbed me, man. She just grabbed me over the fence. Cervantes says she had just got a job after looking for several months. She was supposed to start this week. Then she woke up to losing her home. However, she is remaining optimistic. Thank the Lord I'm okay. Sarah Acosta, KSAT 12 News. We have now learned the name of the woman who died in a crash with a utility pole on the city's north side yesterday. San Antonio police identified her as 61-year-old Rosalva Tamas. According to investigators, she was killed after another vehicle crashed into hers in the 3500 block of West Avenue. The crash sent her car right into that utility pole. Witnesses told police that the 83-year-old driver that hit her had been driving erratically. Officers say the man told them he did not remember the crash even happening. No word yet on any charges. And San Antonio police looking for a driver they say hit a man on the city's northwest side last night. Officers responded to the scene on Vance Jackson near I-10 just before 10 o'clock. The victim, we're told, was crossing the street when an SUV hit him, then drove away. We're told the victim was taken to the hospital but is expected to be okay.
We want to take you to a traffic trouble spot with Time Saver Traffic. What you're looking at is uh, the Topper Wine uh, exit here at uh, I-35 at Judson. Uh, there is an accident. You can see it on the left-hand side of the uh, the northbound lanes there. Uh, fire on the scene. It is backing up traffic. This is already a spot that backs up at this hour of the day. So with this accident, you can expect a really long commute trying to get out of town heading northbound on I-35. Meanwhile, it is pretty outside. 72 degrees at 609, but we do need some rain. Yeah, we do. The but unfortunately, we don't have any good chances of it. At least we have a nice sunset to look at, right? It's beautiful out there right now. You can open the windows if you want, but uh, do be aware of the high pollen count. Aquifer down just a little bit, about three and a half feet above average, but mold is high now. The count of 1,300 oak still in the count, low for now. We know oak season's about to really hit us. Ash is on the low end. Right now we're sitting at 72 degrees, comfortable. By 8 p.m., 62, so cool it off quickly, and then by 10 p.m., we'll be 57 degrees. All right, we'll talk more about the rain chances and our latest drought monitor coming right up. Humans have been heating up their food for nearly 2 million years. But before that, raw foods were our main source of sustenance. And while that sounds a lot healthier, raw foods can actually lead to diseases such as E. coli, salmonella, staph, mercury poisoning, and even listeria. So which is better? A new study shed some light on eat what each one does to your gut. Cold or slightly warm, raw foods are everywhere, from fruits and nuts to even sushi. There's been a 92% increase in raw food orders over the past year. Raw food studies have linked raw food to weight loss, where men are nearly 15% under normal weight range and women are 25%. But that's not the whole story. A new study by University of California, San Francisco and Harvard University shows raw and cooked foods might each have a different impact on your gut microbiome. That is the collection of microbes that live in your intestines and help you digest food. The gut microbiome is a major source of immune inflammatory molecules, some of which can access the brain. Researchers from the schools found mice that ate sweet potatoes developed significantly different microbiomes when the foods were consumed raw. In fact, the animals on the raw potato diet had poor bacterial diversity in their gut, fewer bacteria, and they lost more weight. Scientists then repeated the study in humans and again found clear differences in gut bacteria when the participants were exposed to raw foods versus cooked foods. Other studies have shown cooking food can alter its nutritional components and may actually provide more energy. Researchers say they want to continue studying the effects of raw and cooked foods to learn more about how they affect your body. It's all so interesting. The scientists found that the gut microbiome in mice didn't change at all between raw or cooked meat, but the starchy potatoes had a dramatic effect. Mmm, starchy potatoes. You're Sounds hungry. really good. Yeah, yeah. I am. We're Thank hungry for some rain, too. <laughs> yeah, we are. We could use some rain around here, and I just got the latest drought monitor, so I'll be sharing that with you again and take, comparing it to what we had last week as well. But, you know, if we can't get what we want, at least it's really nice out. It is. It is. <laughs> Very nice. It's, Barbecue yeah. weather out there. There you go. Exactly. And it's going to last into this upcoming weekend as well. So if you like today, you know, really the next couple of days will just be an extension of it. And look at this. This is great. I just I had to share this with you. It's a beautiful sunset that's taking shape because we have just enough high thin clouds that are starting to stream overhead. So picture perfect weather again the next couple of days. The clouds do fill in as we get into Sunday. And it looks like we'll get into a stretch here with kind of a messy pattern aloft. That's going to give us a decent amount of cloud cover, but probably not much rain to show for that cloud cover. Today we topped out at 75. That's four degrees above average. Look at the record high, 94, set back in 1991. And our morning low was exactly average at 48 degrees. Right now we're hovering around 70 degrees, give or take. Bernie Stage Airfield at 68. Meanwhile, Divine is 75. New Braunfels 72, along with uh, Bandera at 72, Canyon Lake now 
at 71. And no big temperature difference when you widen out the view. For the most part, some low to mid 70s, even southwest of town. So overall, very comfortable and pleasant. Dew points are down, dry, crisp air in place. But that means we cool off very efficiently. So by early tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., I think most of us will be in the mid 40s, but 45 in San Antonio and in the lower 40s in parts of the hill country. You get into Timberwood Park, probably 45, Lake Hills, 48 degrees. And then by the afternoon, we'll have a lot of sunshine. And I think just about all of us will be at or slightly above 70 degrees. You get north of town, Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, Bernie, New Braunfels, maybe a degree shy of 70, but still a very comfortable and pleasant day. And when you look at high temperatures for the days ahead, we're going to even out right around 70, give or take, all the way through the weekend. Then we get into next week and we could be pushing 80 degrees for a few days. And that's even with the added cloud cover that we're anticipating. All right, so let's talk about the drought monitor. This is last week's, okay? So I'm going to slowly transition into this week so you can see the difference right now. And notice how that red, which is extreme drought, extreme drought overspread a good portion of South Texas, and unfortunately, it expanded. Today, of course, no favors to uh, from the weather to relieve us from the drought. Just total sunshine. We have this northwesterly flow aloft, and that's given us dry air aloft, so all that sunshine. The good soaking rain from the system that even clipped us with some showers yesterday morning. That's now moving out of the southeastern United States and going in, into the Atlantic Ocean. Now our weather pattern is going to shift a bit and you see this wind here that's coming off the Pacific Ocean moving into northern Mexico. That's going to take over here as we get into tomorrow and the drier that we have right now aloft is going to be replaced by these high thin clouds. This moisture up above us is going to be streaming overhead and it's just going to make for a little variety in our sky tomorrow and Saturday. But by Sunday, with a little added humidity in the air, that's when I think we'll get back into a pattern of more gray than blue. But unfortunately, not a lot of rain to show for the extra gray in the sky. I mean, look at our rain chances. Sunday, yeah, maybe a morning sprinkle, 10% chance. By Monday, we're looking at a 20% chance. And basically all next week with extra clouds, anywhere from a 10 to 30% chance of rain. So nothing too widespread. And even if we do see some drops out there, nothing significant, unfortunately. That's the way it looks right now. So tomorrow, another sunny, beautiful day. 45 at 7 a.m. By noon, already 66. 4 o'clock, 72 for the high temperature and a light northeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. Going into the weekend, there's the extra cloud cover on Sunday. And that's going to stick around through a good portion of next week. So Enjoy and savor the sunshine while we have it because it's going to be more limited starting Sunday, lasting through all of next week. More spring like. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right, Larry. So DeMar DeRozan putting up points, but he's not shooting a lot of threes. No, I mean, that's the trend in the NBA right now. A lot of guys are shooting up threes at a historical pace, it seems like, but not DeMar. He's still relying on that mid range J. And in high school hoops, Lady Patriots will play in the 5A state semis tonight. Coming up. No, Pop's going to be back. I'll be happy to hand it right over to him. <laughs> Yeah, Tim Duncan is ready to let Greg Popovich take back the coaching reins in big board sports. Spurs small forward DeMar DeRozan leads the team in scoring this season at 22.2 points per game, and he's doing it with his mid-range jumper. Thanks to analytics, the NBA has undergone radical changes in the way the game is played. The mid-range jumper isn't what it used to be, not used as much. Traditional centers are becoming obsolete. Small ball three-pointers are all the rage. A drive, kick it out for three, it's just the way it is. But DeRozan hasn't changed his style. He's only attempted 30 three-pointers this season, which is an average of .5 per game. That's his game. He's, he's a power player. He's, he's not committed to, to, to shooting the three. Um, he actually shot it pretty well early on in the year for a stretch, um, but he's not committed to that. He's comfortable with playing that in that mid-range and attacking the basket. And, uh, yeah, he is our guy. We're going down the stretch. He's the guy we want to go to. Um, and uh, on top of uh, being a mid-range scorer like that, he's an excellent passer, and he's done a great job of uh, uh, breaking a defense down, getting it to the middle, and finding people when he has to. Uh, even with a lot of the guys starting to go underneath, uh, under on him and trying to keep him in front, he's, he's still being effective. 
All right, let's put DeMar's three-point shooting into perspective. The Rockets' James Harden leads the NBA with 730 three-point attempts this season. The Kings' Buddy Hill is next with 591. Damon Lillard is third. Devontae Graham fourth. And the Hawks tree Young is fifth with 533. So DeMar ranks 337 out of 513 players this season, which is 33-point attempts. I mean, think about it. Harden has fired up 700 more threes then DeMar. Spurs will play at the Brooklyn Nets tomorrow night at 6.30. The Nets are currently 7th in the East. Speaking of the Nets, they were hosting the Grizzlies last night. Back-to-back -back games for Brooklyn, and perhaps they were tired because Memphis outscored them 36-14 in the fourth quarter, and they led by as many as 41 points. Memphis made 20 three-pointers, or just seven for Brooklyn. Three-pointers are alive and well. Brooklyn falls at home 118-79. to Checking out the race for eighth in the West, Memphis has a fairly solid hold in the final playoff spot. Three and a half games ahead of Portland and Sacramento and four games in front of the Spurs. According to the playoffstatus.com, the Spurs have a 10% chance to win the eighth spot and they do not control their own destiny. They clearly need some help. The Alamo Dome is the place to be for girls high school basketball. The UIL state semifinals tipping off this morning. Six games with the final contest tonight, a 5A semifinal showdown between San Antonio Veterans Memorial and Mansfield Timberview. Lady Patriots are 31 and 7 and ranked 43rd in the state. Timberview Views 31 and 8 and number 12 in Texas. Two seasons ago, Veterans Memorial advanced the state in the Class 4A, losing in the final. They're back and hoping to win it all. It's very exciting. I, the first time I did this my freshman year, I didn't know what I was doing, and now I know how important it is, and I'm ready to get into it. Very exciting. You know, we worked all together. You know, we've been working really hard for this. You know, since. The beginning of the school year, we've just been working really hard and working to our, towards our goal. The girls are really, you know, in tune and they're really, really understanding, you know, from the first time we went what, what needs to be done for the second time. Mansfield Timberview and Veterans Memorial scheduled for 8.30 tonight at the Alamo Dome. And Texas State senior guard Nigel Pearson was named the 2019-20 Sunbelt Conference Player of the Year and was selected to the All-Sunbelt First Team today by the league office. Pearson is the first Bobcat to be selected as the Player of the Year for the Sunbelt Conference. He's averaging 19.3 points per game this season. Pretty cool for him going on a high Good note. For him. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Still to come at six, how a program is helping some talented young local musicians follow passions when they otherwise wouldn't be able to do it. And what's being done to ease concerns and the spread of the coronavirus across the country. That's next at six. The concerns over the coronavirus continue as health officials and lawmakers increase their efforts to take on the virus. Whitney Wild has more on what officials are doing to make more test kits available. A cruise ship floating off the coast of California serves as the latest symbol of ramped up precautions against coronavirus. I'm concerned that we may not get off by Saturday when we have a flight out on Sunday. Officials say the Grand Princess carried a passenger on an earlier cruise who later died after contracting the virus. Some of the passengers and crew currently on the boat also sailed with that person. For now, officials won't let anyone leave. We are going to be flying testing kits uh, to the cruise ship and we are going to be sending those quickly back to the state. Around the country, officials and private medical companies are developing more test kits. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar says labs will be able to test at least 475,000 people by the end of the week with CDC issued and private test kits. As this expands, that experience will get better. But right now, there is, it is a challenge. Azar adds private companies are rapidly issuing new test kits and says the total number of people who could be tested may reach as high as one and a half million by the end of next week. That means more traditional things like you're, you're in the hospital, that hospital might very well then have that test in their lab, be able to test you right there if that hospital buys that test and has it. In Washington, I'm Whitney Wild reporting. In news around Texas, add Netflix to the list of big name companies that are taking a pass on South by Southwest. It's joining a number of high tech companies canceling due to coronavirus concerns. An annual conference still set to start though next Friday in Austin. 
Despite pressure from some businesses and a petition, organizers say this show will go on. Medical officials say there's no evidence that closing South by Southwest would make the area more safe. Facebook, Mashable, TikTok, and Intel among those that have already said they will not be participating in the festival this year. One of the top fugitives in the state is behind bars in Houston after nearly a year on the run. 20-year-old Willie James Brumfield was wanted for child trafficking, compelling prostitution, aggravated robbery, and evading arrest. Law enforcement had been looking for him since March of last year after he bolted from his home in Houston. Well, thanks to several tips, the U.S. Marshals Gulf Coast Violent Offender Task Force was able to track him down to an apartment complex in southwest Houston. And all of those people who called in those tips will be getting a reward from Texas Crime Stoppers. They are the next generation of music leaders, delighting people with their excellence in classical music. The Youth Orchestra of San Antonio performs in the world's greatest concert halls, but not all promising young musicians in the Alamo City have been able to have the economic means to perfect their skills. Alicia Barrera visited with a rising star from the city's west side who's received a lot of support through one of Yosa's programs. Would you believe that the same composer of this punk rock violin piece would perform such classics as Barrios Concerto Number Nine in A Minor. I, I just play it. I close my eyes, and when I'm done, I, I feel better than I did five minutes ago. John J. Science and Engineering sophomore Nicholas Garza first picked up the violin five years ago in an after-school program. I started writing my own music around sixth grade, and then I started recording myself in seventh grade. And then by eighth grade, I started taking up to a whole nother level. He's now in his second year as a Rising Star Fellow. It's a program designed to support minority, low-income musicians across San Antonio. It was a little intimidating at first. I, I've discovered we're, we're all musicians. His talent has placed him in the second highest orchestra of Yosa. I am 10th chair in the first violin section in symphony orchestras. I mean, of course, there are levels of di different skill, but we, we don't judge each other on that. We, we mentor each other. The program provides weekly private sessions for the fellows to improve their technique. I remember just from taking, taking my first two private lessons from a member of the San Antonio Symphony, it, it just changed the whole way I thought about it. And I was able to, to be more expressive with it. Up next, Carnegie Hall, a visit he never thought possible due to lack of money. Last year, um, John Jay went with O'Connor to go play at Carnegie Hall and to go ha have fun in New York City. So we couldn't afford it. But now to have this experience provided for us for free, it, it, it's wonderful, it's amazing. The Rising Star Fellows have been invited to perform alongside the top Yosa Orchestra this summer, an experience Nicholas is grateful for and eager to see how it'll influence his future punk rock violin compositions and beyond. So I, I love doing um, punk rock violin. There's so much you can do with it. You're never limited. You can be playing beautiful one minute, and then the, the, the next you're just going crazy or bashing out. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. New speculation about life on Mars after this picture got the attention of people on the Internet. But that picture isn't a new picture when it was taken and why scientists say it could hold clues about the red planet's past still to come. And now that Elizabeth Warren has dropped out of the race for the Democratic presidential nomination, there are only two left in the running. How that contest is shaping up now, next at 6. The shape of the presidential race is shifting once again. Now, a two-man race, as Senator Elizabeth Warren has also dropped out. She told her campaign staff this morning, and that decision comes after Joe Biden's huge Super Tuesday comeback. So far, he's won 10 states. Bernie Sanders has won three. California, still undecided. ABC Serena Marshall has more from Washington. Senator Elizabeth Warren saying goodbye to the presidential race. I will not be running for president in 2020. Bowing out after a disappointing showing on Super Tuesday, even failing to win her home state of Massachusetts. The race now a two man show. All those little girls are going to have to wait four more years. Um, 
that's going to be hard. Former Vice President Joe Biden racking up 10 states on Super Tuesday, knocking Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders out of frontrunner status. The big comeback after endorsements from his former rivals, including Michael Bloomberg yesterday. Defeating Donald Trump starts with uniting behind the candidate with the best shot to do it. Leading to accusations that Biden's backers in the Democratic establishment are ganging up on Sanders. An establishment of all those hard-working middle-class people, those African-Americans, those Sanders trails Biden in the popular vote and delegates, struggling to bring out the younger voters he appeals to. Have we been as successful as I would hope in bringing young people in? And the answer is no. Sanders also receiving flack for this new ad featuring former Democratic President Barack Obama. They want somebody who's going to fight for them. And they will find it in Bernie. An ad that could be easily confused for an endorsement, even as the former president has remained quiet. With Elizabeth Warren out, she's now a coveted endorsement, but she says she's not quite ready to make one. Instead, she wants to take some time, take a breath, and think. Serena Marshall, ABC News, Washington. We want to take a look outside with live cam, just in case you haven't looked out the window or gone outside today. This is the end of probably one of the prettiest days we've had in South Texas. Yeah, beautiful day out there today. And you know what, if you liked it, I really think the next couple of days will just be an extension of this. And as you can tell, it is Thermometer Thursday here when you look at my desk here in the Weather Center. You've been it's, working. I have been working. It's, it's, it's a busy job, it's a lot to keep track of. I do want to point out that Next couple of days will be just as beautiful, but we need some rainfall. I'll be back with the latest drought monitor and show you where we've gotten the rain lately and talk about our rain chances. And of course, the thermometer fun coming right up. There's a new buzz around the red planet over a picture of a hole on Mars. It's an image posted to NASA's astronomy picture of the day page and a science blog this week. It shows a hole on a volcano which was discovered in 2011. Some believe it looks like an opening to an underground cavern. Yeah, that opening about 115 feet across, 66 feet deep the cavern is. It's not clear why there's a circular crater around the hole and this kind of hole is particularly interesting to scientists. The reason is that the caves are protected from Mars's harsh surface. That means they're relatively good candidates for containing life. But it's not a new picture. Hmm. This has hmm. been around for a while. We're, it's only now just getting a lot of traction on online. Hmm. Well, we'll see if there's any life out there. But right now we are living in some pretty good weather, although we mm -hmm. do need some rain. Yes. I mean, we can't get what we want and what we need, so let's just get let's some just beautiful weather. We you know? Yeah, hey, take we'll you take advantage of the lovely weather while we have it because we know the days are numbered until the humidity returns and, of course, the mercury gets back to 90 degrees. That's just right around the corner, so let's take advantage of these lovely days. But I do want to start out with a look at the drought monitor and take a look at this. Across the state, 21% of Texas is considered in a drought and that of course is here in South Texas and not only just a drought, but we're talking extreme drought indicated by that red color there. Pleasanton toward Uvalde, Catula just south of Eagle Pass into Laredo and Webb County, Dimmick County, LaSalle. Yeah, a, an extreme drought. Then you look just north of town and northwest of town and Bandera, Kendall, Eastern Kerr, Gillespie. <laughs> No drought, not even considered abnormally dry. So this is where we need the rain the most. And we did just have a rain event around here, but unfortunately, we didn't get it where we needed it. A few little areas of light rain and closer to Carrizo Springs, La Prior, and Northward and Crystal City area. But that's about it in terms of the rest of the state. Look at this. They really cashed in along the I-20 corridor, even from San Angelo toward Lubbock eastward toward the Metroplex. They had some good rainfall on the order of two to three inches. Parts of East Texas did as well. But as I showed you a moment ago, that's not where we need the rain. We need it farther down into South Texas. This just wasn't our time. And it looks like the rain chances are pretty slim here for the foreseeable future. This is a quiet weather pattern. We had nothing but sunshine today. This northwesterly flow aloft is going to turn 
southwesterly. So you see these clouds that are over Mexico. These are high, thin, beautiful cirrus clouds that'll be headed our way. We have the dry air in place right now, but up above us, this moisture and those high thin clouds are going to be streaming overhead the next couple of days. It's going to give us a good variety to our sky and really make for some beautiful days. And these clouds are going to continue to thicken and we'll have more cloud cover, but it doesn't look like it's going to translate into any rainfall, not the kind of clouds that give us any good rain or appreciable rain or anything that's very meaningful. So here's a look at our rain chances. Sunday, 10%, maybe a few sprinkles in the morning. Yeah. Not a big deal. Monday, 20% by Thursday next week, about 30%. So despite overall increase in cloud cover and more gray in our sky, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to translate that into rainfall. For the most part, 60s and 70s right now across the state. You get down into San Antonio, it's 72. Carrizo Springs, 70. 64 Rock Springs. Right now, New Braunfels, we're at 72. So as we start the day tomorrow, we'll start the day at 45. You'll notice a bit of a chill in the air early. We'll have a lot of sunshine though, so we're going to warm up quickly. 66 at noon and then by 4 p.m. 72. Just those high thin clouds streaming overhead. So a beautiful day, maybe long sleeves or a sweatshirt for the kids at the bus stop, but then later in the day, anything goes. It'll be comfortable outside in the low 70s. All right, as we get into the weekend, we'll continue this comfortable weather. Highs right near 70. The extra clouds come into play as we get into Sunday. Probably some low morning clouds, a little bit of dampness, maybe a sprinkle, but no good rainfall expected. And that's going to be the case all through next week. More gray than blue in the sky and rain chances, though, not really living up to what we need them to be despite the extra clouds. Temperatures, though, will be warm in a bit, closer to 80 by midweek. If we have the clouds, we want the rain. I know, unfortunately, that's not the case. But we all want a thermometer. <laughs> that's right. I, I have to admit, y'all caught me a little off guard there earlier. I was actually blowing glass. Yeah, <laughs> no, I saw you. Center. You were busy. I got a little bit done. Uh, I've, I've been very busy, and um, I've, just, I've tried to catch up with the, uh, with the charity Okay. thermometers for the silent auctions. Right. So um, Lone Star Parkinson right. Society at New Braunfels this weekend. Yes, I'm getting it to you down to the wire. It's on Saturday. You're getting it just in time. But as I've been busy lately, I want to show you this. I've run into a few problems uh, more so than I usually do. So usually takes about 15, 20 minutes for me to blow the glass to get the proper bulb at the bottom of the thermometer. Well, all that work for nothing. If you look closely. Are those holes? Yes. Uh, oh. Unfortunately, every once in a while I get greedy and I just want to make it a little bit bigger. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Mm. And then pop. I thin the glass too much and it wow. blows a hole through it. And then all that work for nothing. I have an Wasted idea. Wasted thermometers. Yeah. What if you made like a little wind chime out of those? <laughs> okay, I like that idea, actually. I'm going to save those from now on. Yeah, and good then idea. Put, a, put a little plaque with the thermometer on it <laughs> yes. and then have those little danglies. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Ursula, I like this. And I have another idea. Oh, boy. They also would make nice Christmas ornaments. Oh, they could. Yeah, you're right. That would be good. Hmm. A little, little icicle. See, this is why I bring up these all my issues, because we can turn them into positives. That's good. Right. Anyway, Joshua Plover of San Antonio, I just contacted you. You're the winner of this week's homemade thermometer ornament. You can go to case that, or not ornament, actual thermometer. I've already got it <laughs> thinking about it. See how that works? <laughs> In case you missed it, it's coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Thursday, Thursday, March 5th. Here goes my house. A woman no longer has a place to call home after her house on the southeast side burned down early this morning. That fire then spreading to the home next door. The San Antonio Fire Department says the home is destroyed. The fire broke out at 3 Thursday morning in her southeast side home in the 400 block of Shank Avenue. When crews arrived, her home was already being devoured by flames and had spread to the home next door. Firefighters were able to put out the fire in the attic of her next door neighbor's home and saved it. But that wasn't the case for Cervantes. 
this. I've lost everything. And San Antonio police are also looking for this man. He's accused of assaulting and robbing another man. Police say this person went up to a man in the 11,800 block of Bandera back on February 10th. They say he assaulted that victim, then drove off in a red pickup truck with his personal property. If you recognize this man, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Another contender for the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination has dropped from the race. After failing to win in any of the contests so far, Elizabeth Warren is bowing from the campaign, leaving Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden to duke it out. The San Antonio Food Bank wants to help 300,000 low-income households in Southwest Texas. It's part of our latest KSAC community event. For the next month, the food bank is collecting food and supplies so they can put together 300,000 coronavirus preparedness kits. It's an opportunity for our community um, to make sure those that are most vulnerable aren't left out and left behind and left even more vulnerable. We want to take you back to that trouble spot, which is no longer a trouble spot at I-35 in Judson. Just a few minutes ago, this was all backed up traffic heading northbound on I-35 right around Topperwine. And as you can see now, all lanes are open and traffic is moving freely. And tomorrow morning we'll wake up to temperatures mostly in the mid 40s and even around San Antonio. I think Stone Oak area 45 get toward Lackland 48 along with Von Army and Lavernia about 48 in the morning. Then by the afternoon with a lot of sunshine, another beautiful, beautiful day. I think lower 70s for a good portion of us. Then into the weekend right near 70 degrees. Some high thin clouds stream, streaming overhead until Sunday. That's when some thicker clouds should roll in, but I don't think we'll squeeze much, if any, rain out of them, even as we get into next week. All right. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 6 with us. We'll see you back here for the Night Beat at 10.